All right, I do appreciate the opportunity to be here, and we're going to get into the prophecy uh, this time. I did mention to Brother Hawking that I wanted to do a little thing on Easter first, so I will do that. But we're Doug and Judy Stauffer, and we're your partners for truth. My website is BibleDoug.com. I mentioned in the last service at the end, I will have a new website uh, that'll take over all of the sites. It'll be called ProphecyWars.com. That'll be sometime next month. Um, I'm also on Twitter, Doug underscore Stauffer, and then also Douglas Stauffer 1611 on Facebook. Uh, I have a rapture package. Um, there's two books. I've got the two books up here. Uh, there are people that have said that this is a spiritual masterpiece. I am not saying that. I'm just telling you, people that have read this book, there's a lot of charts in it, um, believe that it is one of the most eye-opening books on the rapture of the church. I am staunchly pre-trib. Uh, I wasn't, I always was, but always wasn't sure why. Uh, now I can tell you that there's not a verse in the Bible that gives me a hiccup, not that there will not be some in the future that will, but right now there's an answer for every um, problem that people bring up on the pre-trib rapture. Here's another book that I co-authored or put a chapter in with uh, James Knox. It's called That Blessed Hope. And um, it's in this package. There's seven DVDs, 11 CDs, over 25 hours of teaching on there. Um, and I do want you to avail yourself of that while we're here um, because I think it's very important. We put these materials out because we believe in it. I'm a very easy read. In other words, I write about a ninth grade reading level. I rewrite my stuff about 30 times. One of the th two comments that I get all the time. I read your book five times, and it's the first book I ever read cover to cover. And the reason for that is because I don't try to impress you with my knowledge. Um, I do have a lot of degrees. I'm a CPA, so I've got an accounting degree from Penn State uh, University. I've got a Bible degree. I've got a BA, BS, THM, PhD, and I'm CPA. So I got a lot of letters. I don't know if those initials mean anything other than the PhD. I do know that's post hole digger. I know that one. Um, CPA, I think, is couldn't pass accounting. So I got that one too. But uh, I do want you to, this is the CD set, the DVDs, and the two books. Uh, they are on the back table back here. Pasca, it was brought up. I don't usually respond, you know, when something's brought up, but I don't usually get, you know, sort of pointed out a little bit too. So I want to deal with this. Easter in the Bible is in there for a reason. Pascha in the Bible is translated, it's 29 times, 28 times, it's Passover, one time, Easter in Acts 12, 4. Why did the King James translator, some of the most brilliant men ever to walk the face of the earth, as far as languages go, put Easter in there? And again, it's the context. Every time you study your Bible, you study it in context. This has been a big debate for a long time, but I'm going to give you my take on the debate. Easter, the Greek word Pascha, means Easter today. The Oxford Greek English Learner's Dictionary 2012, among many, lists the word Pascha, and the very first definition is Easter. The second one is Passover. In fact, I have Greek friends. When I go to those Greek friends, I'll say, tell me, what, over in Greece, when you say Easter, what do you say? And they say Pascha. So it is a definition of the Greek word, and now you've got to determine why did they choose to use Easter this one time and 28 times, Passover, and it's only in the King James Bible, which I believe is superior, obviously, or I wouldn't have spent all that time on it last time. Here's the verse, Acts 12, 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he, who is that? Herod. So we're talking about Herod every time you see a highlight there. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then you have a side thought here. It's in parentheses. It's in there because it's an aside. In other words, it's not the main topic. Then were the days of unleavened bread. So that gives you the focus of when it was. During the days of unleavened bread, you not only have Passover, but you have Ishtar, the, the, the pagan holiday of Easter. You know, I don't celebrate Easter. 
I celebrate Resurrection Day just because that's what we're going to call it. We, we say, you know, Happy Resurrection Day. We have people that come in the church, you know, on, on Easter morning because they go Easter and Christmas. Listen, we want them there. We want them to come to church. We don't dog them because they celebrate Easter and have Easter bunnies that don't lay eggs and they don't understand why that is. It's a fertility God, obviously. So why is Easter in the Bible? Verse 4, and when he, who? Herod, had apprehended him, he, who? Herod, put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So why the, par why the parenthetical thing? The parenthetical thing was the days of unleavened bread because that's not the topic. The topic is not Passover. The topic is that Herod wanted to celebrate his holiday before he put him to death. It's as simple as that. This isn't about the Jews. This is about a, a pagan king who wanted to celebrate his pagan Ishtar before he went to the trouble to put somebody to death that was a Christian. That's as simple as I can make it. Anyway, I appreciate Brother Hawking. I, I love the man. I think he's done phenomenal work, but I, I do disagree. I think it is not a mistranslation. I believe it's in there. I don't believe the King James translators went through and went Passover, Passover, Passover 28 times and went, what was that word again for Pascha? Was it, was it Easter? No, they determined it was Easter because that's what the context was. It was a pagan king celebrating a pagan holiday. Now, when will the day of the Lord begin? Now, I don't have a handout. Can, can somebody give me a handout? You can go get yourself another one back there. Thank you. Um, and I need it because there's 36 points. I do not think we will finish this today. I think we're going to have to do part of it today and part of it in the first service tomorrow. But this is session eight. I speak a lot on prophecy. I mean a, a tremendous amount. And this is where I would probably put this in. I'd have seven sessions leading up to this one. But this is so important. Brother Hawking said the day of the Lord is not the second coming, he's right, and it is also not the seven years of tribulation. There are many people who say, well, the day of the Lord is the whole seven-year period. That's not right. It's a time of gloominess, and, 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 and like Brother Hawking made mention of, it's a terrible, terrible time, this day of the Lord. And we'll look at what that means here in a minute. But here's what I want to stress. You take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. One of the things that I do, I preach the Bible. When we go in here, I'm going to give you Scripture after Scripture after Scripture after Scripture because what I say doesn't matter. What the Bible says is what matters. First thing I do is chart the New Testament. The church age has lasted for about 2,000 years, probably started, you know, or at least was uh, hatched, you might say, on the day of Pentecost. Uh, you know, there's some debate right around there, but Paul said he persecuted the church and wasted it. He preached the faith which he once destroyed, so Paul was destroying that which he then came to believe, so it had to exist before the Apostle Paul. There is a lot of debate on that. Well, Paul's the one, one revealed it. Yes, Paul revealed the mystery, but it doesn't mean that God wasn't doing something behind the scenes and just had Paul be the revealer to the church. So you have the church age, the last approximately 2,000 years. The next thing on there is the rapture of the church. You see the arrow going up, arrow coming down. That's us meeting him in the clouds, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and other places. The next period you have on the far right is the millennium. It's a thousand-year period. It is the day of the Lord. A day, a day is with the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. The day of the Lord is inclusive of that thousand-year period. I will prove that as we go along in the teaching. Daniel's 70th week comes in between the church age, the, the rapture, and the millennium. I am pre-trib, 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 because that's what the Bible is. There is not one Scripture verse in the Bible that teaches a post-trib, mid-trib, pre-wrath, or any other rapture. The rapture happens. The church is out of here before any part of Daniel's 70th week starts. Why? Because Daniel's 70th week is for Israel. It's the nation of Israel. It's his people, thy people, Daniel, thy city, Jerusalem. It has nothing to do with the church. 
There's three and a half year period. It's usually split in half. It talks about 1,260 days, talks about 42 months, talks about time, times, and half a time, which is three and a half years. So it splits the two. You have two witnesses for how long? Three and a half years. You have an Acts in, in Revelation 12, Satan is cast down on the earth. He persecutes the woman for how long? Three and a half years. And there are reasons for that because the abomination of desolation happens in the middle. That's the hinge pin of everything. There are things that happen before the first three and a half years. Then the abomination of desolation, when Satan is cast out of heaven, he's cast this earth. Michael the archangel leaves this earth. He goes up. He's the protector of Israel. Israel no longer has protection on this earth after the halfway point. He who now let will let until he's taken out of the way. Michael goes up into heaven, casts Satan down to this earth, and Israel flees because when they see the abomination of desolation, they realize he has desecrated the temple and they've been lied to, and they're to flee at that time. That's the blessed hope there. The day of Christ, now this will be controversial for those that aren't King James. The day of Christ is in the King James Bible. The day of Christ is not the day of the Lord. And if you don't distinguish between the day of Christ, which we're not going to teach in this lesson, and the day of the Lord, you have a problem. Because the day of Christ uh, in Philippians 2, 15, 2 something, I don't want to look it up. It's in Philippians. It talks about the day of Christ, and it shows that we're going to be judged at the day of Christ. The rapture happens, and the day of Christ starts in heaven. The day of the Lord starts seven years later here on earth. You have the false covenant after the rapture where he makes a covenant or he at least confirms the covenant. Not makes the covenant, but confirms one. Maybe he confirms God's covenant of the land covenant, uh, but, but it's a false covenant. And then in the middle you have the covenants broken, the abomination of desolation. You have what's called the great tribulation, although it just says great tribulation. It's just a descriptive adjective. How bad's the tribulation in the second half? It's great. But it's not necessarily just called the great tribulation. You have the sun and the moon darkened, and then you have the angels gathering the elect, Matthew 24, verses 29 through 31. He gathers the elect, what? For protection. And here's a verse, number, or Deuteronomy 4.30. When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, so you'd have to read the beginning of chapter 4, even in the latter days, so what are the latter days? They're right there. If thou turn to the Lord thy God and shalt be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers which he swear unto them. That's Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 30 and 31. So the day of the Lord is out here. The day of the Lord, the Bible says the sun and the moon shall be darkened before that great and terrible day of the Lord. The Bible says that Elijah will come before the day of the Lord. Well, Elijah is one of the two witnesses. You have Moses and Elijah. You say, I thought it's Enoch. Enoch's a picture of the church. Enoch never dies. Enoch is a picture of the rapture of the church before the flood, before the destruction of the earth. You say, well, how can that be? It's appointed unto men once to die. Enoch's an exception to the rule. How can that be? Well, let me ask you, if you're raptured and you're still alive, are you an exception to the rule? You'll never die. But it's appointed unto men once to die. Enoch will never die. Elijah will die as one of the two witnesses. But Enoch is a picture of the church before Noah's flood on this earth. So you have the day of the Lord over here. The day of the Lord covers the whole thousand years. Understanding the timing of the day of the Lord is a primary key to unlocking eschatology. In the day of the Lord, this is what you have. Send Elijah before the day of the Lord. It'll be with trouble, distress, wasteness, desolation, darkness, gloominess, clouds. Just like Brother Hawking said, it is a terrible, terrible, terrible time. It can't be the whole seven years then. Because there's, there, there's a relative peace on earth during the first part of the tribulation. When is the day of the Lord? Great question. This is the point number one. You'll see outline 01 on the bottom left. That goes along with what your handout is. So everything you got up until then is free. Now it's going to cost you. you got to look. The day of the Lord is when the Lord leaves heaven's glory and takes charge. 
He actually steps back into man's time and inserts his will upon the earth. That's the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord when, when, when God's will is done on this earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the way it'll be when the day of the Lord starts. How long is the day of the Lord? 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12. Well, let's look at verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not either this one thing, for that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years. And a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. One day with the Lord can equal 1,000 years upon the earth. That's what it's teaching right there. One day is with the Lord is a thousand years. Let's continue. 2 Peter 3.10, but the day of the Lord. Look at what we just did. We went from verse 7, 8, 9, and now we're at verse 10, and here's the context. But the day of the Lord will come as a what? Thief in the night. That thief is very important. That thief does not deal with the rapture of the church. You say, well, I remember a movie put out by somebody that was called A Thief in the Night. Maybe a great movie, terrible title. Because the thief has nothing to do with the rapture of the church. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the witch. In the witch what? In the witch, in the day of the Lord. In the day of the Lord. In the witch, what's going to happen? The heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So when's he going to come as a thief? He's going to come as a thief right here toward the end of the seven years. And then when's the earth going to be burned up? After the thousand years. So you see, you've got, it says, in the which these things are going to happen in the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord has to be a thousand-year period because of that teaching there and many others. What are you looking for? 2 Peter 3.11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. What are they looking for? They're looking for the day of God. When does the day of God start? Revelation 16, 14. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So when is the day of God? Battle of Armageddon. It's the battle of that great day of God Almighty. The day of God equals the battle of Armageddon. So you match 2 Peter 3.11 with Revelation 16.14, and you look at verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth, keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame, and he be gathered, and he gathered them together into a place in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So he gathers them together at Armageddon, and he says, I come as a thief. He is not talking about the rapture of the church. In Revelation 16, 15, he's talking about the second coming of the Lord. He is not talking about the rapture of the church. That's seven years before this period of time. What are we looking for? Titus 2.11. Remember it said looking for the day of God? Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared in all men, teaching us the denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. You know why it's so important to believe in the pre-tribulation rapture? Because if you're looking for Jesus and you're looking for him coming back, this describes how you ought to live. You ought to live as a peculiar people zealous of good works purifying yourself, living soberly, righteously, and godly in this present evil world because you're looking for Jesus. If you thought Jesus was coming back tonight, what would you do different? Maybe nothing. You'd probably stay awake during the service. I'm kidding. 
You'd probably be tuned in saying, man, this might be it. And listen, it might be. There is nothing that has to happen before Jesus comes back. You say, well, I thought the gospel had to go into all the world. You're out of context. Paul says the gospel, the grace of God, has gone into all the world. It's been preached to every creature in Colossians. The gospel of the, uh, of the kingdom is going to go into all the world. Then the end shall come. That's totally different. Jesus preached the kingdom. I don't preach the kingdom. I preach the gospel, the grace of God. So there's a difference. That's why you have to rightly divide the word of truth. I have a book that's out of print right now. I wish you would pray about it. It is on the sword searcher back there in a digital copy. It's called One Book Rightly Divided. It's been out of print for about two years. Sells for, before I put it in ebook, it sold for like $1,000 on Amazon, used even. But I need to get that book back in print. It teaches how to study the Bible and how to teach the Bible dispensationally. And yes, I'm a dispensationalist. And don't even apologize for it. Amen? Just checking. Peculiar people, zealous of good works. Paul wrote to the same group in verse 13. Second Peter continues, Nevertheless, we, according to this promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, because you're looking for, he, you know, because Peter's talking about looking for this new heaven, new earth, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Paul wrote about some of these same things. Paul wrote concerning the end times, 2 Peter 3.16, and also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in the which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned, unstable, rest. They do all the other scriptures under their own destruction. You see, there, the, the reason there's a debate today is because some of these things are hard to be understood. I prayed one time and I said, God, if you want me to be post-trib, I'll be post-trib. I don't care what it costs me. I don't care if I lose all my friends. I just want to know the truth. I was willing to do whatever it took to get the truth as far as study. Obedience to God. And you know what? God not only answered that prayer, but he answered it time and time and time again because there were things I was struggling with. Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. By the way, I go through all of the Thessalonians. Matthew 24 is my next book coming out. This one is on all, this is a commentary on 1 and 2 Thessalonians, the prophetic passages. And I don't believe that there's a problem in any one of them. You say, what about 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? We'll get into some of that maybe tomorrow. I'd love to just teach the whole book of 1 and 2 Thessalonians, but I don't know that I'll have enough time with only four sessions. What did Paul preach about and what did Peter mention? Scoffers in the last days, verse 3. This is the context. Promise of Christ's return, verse 4. End time events, verse 7. The day of the Lord, verses 8 through 10. Paul talked about the day of the Lord in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He, they talked about the same thing. They just have a different viewpoint. Paul talked about the day of the Lord. He said, you, don't, you know, you, you don't have to worry about the day of the Lord. It's going to come as a thief in the night. You don't need to worry about the thief. Does anybody know in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 why the church doesn't need to worry about the thief? Because we're not children of the night. Yeah, we're gone, but we're not children of the night. We're children of the what? When's the thief come? At night. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the thief comes at night. We don't have to worry about the thief because we're children of the day. Study the pronouns in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Study those pronouns and see how it goes from us to them. Us to them. And if you just study the pronouns, you'll see he says one thing to us in verses 1 and 2, and he mentions them in verse 3. He mentions us in verse 4 and 5, and he mentions them in in verses 6, 7, and 8. He mentions us in verse 9 and 10 and so on. And you just study that and you'll see the contrast. We don't have to worry about the day of the Lord because the day of the Lord comes of the thief in the night, and the thief in the night, children of the day, don't have to worry about it. He also talked about repentance, verse 9, the thief in the night. Paul mentions the thief in the night in 1 Thessalonians 5. Living godly in light of future events. Paul mentions that in Titus in regard to future events. So I'll do a review for you. The day of the Lord, when Christ comes to rule on the earth. Number two, the day of the Lord equals a thousand years. The day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord equals the day of God, the battle of that great day of God Almighty or Armageddon. 
Jesus' second coming, he comes the thief in the night. Just remember these things as we go through and we study it. What is the day of the Lord? Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah 13, 6. How ye for the day of the Lord is at hand. So is it here at this point? No, it's at hand. It shall come, future, as a destruction from the Almighty. That's what Brother Hawking said. The day of the Lord will come as a destruction. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. Notice the hearts are going to melt. Isaiah links the day of the Lord to Luke 21. Luke 21 is comparable to Matthew 24. And as you go through, Luke 21, verse 25, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and the stars upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity and the sea and the waves roaring, men hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth and for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come, pa- come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Context is verse 11. So we're in Luke 21, 25. Let's look at the context. Verse 11. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be, from heaven. But before all these, so now we're even going further back, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues. This is Israel. And into prisons, being brought unto kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. Context, verse 36. Watch ye therefore and pray that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. This is the second coming. We're not worried about standing before the Son of Man. We're going to be caught up to the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I, I'm not trying to escape anything and be accounted worthy in order to stand before the Son of Man. This is the context of the second coming. No Christian should be praying this prayer because the church leaves almost seven years prior to the day of the Lord. Notice he says, Watch ye therefore and pray that ye may be counted worthy to escape. Some people think, well, some Christians are going to be left behind. That's not true. If you are left behind as part of the body of Christ, the body of Christ is not complete. We are complete in him. You can't, be, you can't be part of the body and be left behind. That's not the way it works. The lost do not escape. Now, my, here's 1 Thessalonians 5. I don't know that I'll, I'll yeah, it does. For, verses 1 and 2 refer to the Christian. If you just study the pronouns, it says, he's, he's talking to him, he says, you, Verse 3 above refers to the lost. Look at what it says. Here's the pronouns. 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. For when they, not us, them, for when they shall say peace and safety, sudden destruction cometh upon what? The church comes upon them. As to prevail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now look at verse 4. But ye... That's why every word of God is pure. Every word of God is important. That's why you can't change one word in this Bible without corrupting what it's supposed to say. He says, but ye, brethren. Who's he talking to? He's talking to believers. This is a church-age epistle. He's talking to Christians, and he mentions brethren too, and he says, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day, the day of the Lord in context, should overtake you, As a thief, you're the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. We are not worried about the thief that comes at night, which is the day of the Lord, because we're children of the day. And he makes those pronouns, and then he flips it again in verse 6 and talks to them. I don't know if it's in here. Uh, It's not. Verses 6 and 7, I I think he flips it there. Now he's back in verse 9. He talks to us again. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Now, 
Salvation in your Bible is not always what you think. It isn't always salvific as in your soul. Here's a verse. The Bible says your salvation is nearer than when ye believed. Well, how can your salvation be near? Because it's talking about your bodily resurrection. You're escaping this life. That's what this salvation is in context. It's not talking about your soul. Your soul's saved. Once saved, you're always saved. For God hath not appointed us, at least somebody's saved over here. Just kidding. I don't want to offend a couple of hundred people at one time. Just did, but you'll get over it. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. People say, wait a minute, chapter 5 continues the thought of chapter 4. Chapter 4 talks about the rapture, verses 13 through 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But the first word of chapter 5, verse 1, does anybody know what it is? It's the word, but. Shows contrast. Here's the rapture, chapter 4, but the day of the Lord, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5. He changes stream. And if you just study your Bible, now all the modern versions change it to and and make it a continuation. Say, so well, I thought you weren't going to preach on the King James anymore. I, I don't know that I can't. How do, you, how, how do you not do it? I'm telling you, it's an issue. It is the biggest issue you have in your life because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by, where's the Word of God? Well, I just think it's in a hundred different versions. Sorry. They say a hundred different things. Can't be. What's the one book that stands alone? It's the King James Bible. Simple as that. Whether the Christian is spiritually awake or spiritually asleep, we will all be with Jesus when Christ returns at the rapture. Review number two. The day of the Lord shall come as a destruction from the Almighty, and the hearts will melt. Men's hearts failing them are melting when they see Jesus returning. Great signs in heaven before the Lord's return. Sudden destruction comes upon the lost. That is the day of the Lord. And then the day of the Lord continues, because he's coming back. The day of the Lord continues 1,000 years. This is number five on your outline. So you see in, ver in 36 of them, we won't get very far. What is the day of the Lord? Isaiah 13 again. This time we're going to look at verse 8. And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows. See the day of the Lord there in verse 6 at the top. We already looked at it. And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. Always remember, the woman that's travailing, that means that her, her, her and I'm not a woman, so I can't tell you for sure, but her pains increase as she gets closer to birth. I think all you women would say, Amen. And you men have no idea what that means. And I agree with you, and I don't want to know. They shall be amazed one another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. You know what the day of the Lord is? It's the destruction of sinners. Say, we'll all sin, but there will be those that will look upon him whom they've pierced and they'll believe in him. There will be those that turn to Christ in the tribulation period. And that's not who it's talking about here. There will be those in the tribulation that when he brings all those judgment upon the earth, you know what it says? They repented not. They repented not. And in Revelation 16, 11, the third time it says, they repented not. God wants them to repent when he brings those things upon the earth, but they're going to refuse to repent. They're going to curse the God of heaven. And he says when, he come, when the day of the Lord comes, it'll be with wrath and fierce anger. It'll destroy the sinners thereof out of it. As a woman in travail, remember Jacob's trouble? Jacob's trouble in the day of the Lord, Jeremiah 30, verse 6. Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Some of these 
Some men in the tribulation period are going to figure out what it's like for you women to have had children. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail? And all faces are turned into paleness. You know, they're just, they've lost all their blood. Alas, for that day, what day? Jacob's trouble, the day of the Lord, is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. Notice what it says, though. But he shall be what? Saved out of it. Who saved out of it? Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Jacob is saved out of it. We are saved from it. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. Verse 10, Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, Neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity, and Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations. Whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. But I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished." Verse 22, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goeth forth with fury, a continuing whirlwind. It shall fall with pain upon the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he have done it, and until he have performed the intents of his heart in the what? Latter days he shall consider it. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 30, Israel's latter days. All your Bible fits together like a glove on a hand. You can't ignore any part of it. You can't change any part of it. You, can, you must leave it as it is, believe what it says, and then faith will come from it. I have had things I struggled with in the Bible that I didn't understand, and then what I did was I just believed the Bible. I said, I don't know, Lord. Would you show me? If you don't show me, I'm still going to believe the Bible. You know what man does today? I don't know what it means, so I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to change it. And then he never sees the error of his ways. You must believe the Bible. Without faith, it's impossible to what? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith, if you don't have faith, you can't please God. That's all there is to it. The latter days matches the latter days of Deuteronomy 4.30, Daniel 2.28, Daniel 10.4, and Hosea 3.5. Back to Isaiah again. Isaiah 13. Verse 10 this time. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth. <clears throat> and the moon shall not cause their light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the gold wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger." You see, at some point, God's going to say that's enough. We're studying Matthew 24 right now, and it talks about all the innocent blood from Genesis to 2 Chronicles. It says the innocent blood from Abel to Zechariah. And what that's talking about in the Hebrew Bible, it starts in Genesis and ends in 2 Chronicles, not in Malachi like the English Bible. So he's saying all that innocent blood from the beginning of the end in the Old Testament, I'm going to hold a generation, that generation accountable. What generation is it? It's the generation of the wicked. When Jesus came in Matthew 24, he said, you're a generation of vipers. You're a wicked generation. He wasn't talking about people living in the first century. 
He wasn't just prophesying of people in the 21st century before his second coming. He was, pa- he was talking about those that had followed the way of Cain, those that were of their father, the devil, he said. In other words, that's the generation. It's not some final generation that will be in the 21st century that started in 1948, and a generation is 40 years, that would be 1988, and that's why so many people said Jesus is coming back in 1988. He didn't come back in 88, and that has nothing to do with the generation he's talking about. We've misdefined the generation. Hopefully, I'll be able to get it finished. I have finished the writing. Actually, I finished it on the plane on the way up here on the generation. Review number three. The day of the Lord comes with wrath and fierce anger to destroy the sinners who are as a woman in travail. Jacob's trouble, the Jews are saved out of that day that makes a full end of all nations. Jacob's trouble, you shall not, you shall be my people, and I will be your God, and the fierce anger finishes. The stars and the sun and moon are darkened in the day of God's fierce anger. After the dark, after uh, after darkened, the Lord sends his angels. In Mark 13, 24, it says, But in those days after that tribulation. Notice it doesn't say after the tribulation period, as so many of our post-trib guys even want to read this. It doesn't matter either way, but I'm just telling you. It says after that tribulation, mentioned in verses 5 through 23, the sun shall be dark and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and then shall he send his angels. That is crucial to see that. The world goes dark, a little spelling error there. Christ sends his angels. Contrast this with what 1 Thessalonians 4 says. For the Lord, what does it say? Is he going to send his angels for us? This is the rapture, and this is the second coming. He's going to send his angels. Why is he going to send his angels? Because he's not going down. He's not coming back here to collect people up. He's going to send his angels to gather the elect for protection because behind him are the armies which left heaven in Revelation 19. He's got a sword coming out of his mouth, which he says is the word of God. He's coming back to battle in Revelation 19 and 11, 19, 14. And he sends his angels on before him and says, gather the elect because I'm coming back for battle. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says, For the Lord himself (coughs) shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. Where is he coming from? He's coming from heaven. And then he's going back to heaven. How do you know? Because again, in Revelation 19, verses 11 and 14, the Bible says, Heaven is open. And the Lord comes back. In Revelation 19, 14, it says, The armies which were in heaven. So where are the armies? Revelation 19, they're not floating around on a cloud. What a post-trib or pre-wrath guy says, we're caught up in the clouds and we sort of just go horizontal to the earth and then come back with them. They have to have a rapture. You can't ignore 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Well, I mean, they can. Some of them do. We're not going to go up here and then float around. We're going with the Lord. Wherever the Lord is, that's where we'll be. Why? So shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the rapture of the church. So in Matthew 24, he sends his angels to gather the elect. Here he says, the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's a whole other story in itself, which I think we will get into. Maybe not. I'm trying to think of what the next one is. I'm gonna, we're going to do the book of Revelation in my fourth service. <clears throat> we'll go through the whole book of Revelation in one, in one hour. Mark 13, 27, and then shall he send his angels and shall gather, the, gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Now, when you see heaven there, that doesn't mean the third heaven. Other, if you study it out, this just means the whole earth from one end of heaven to the other, the first heaven. And I don't have time to, to, to delineate all that. Who are his elect? In Joel 3.14, the Bible says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is what? Near. That means it's not here yet in this verse. 
in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of who? His people. Well, what, are, what is our hope? Ours is the blessed hope of the rapture. It's different from this hope. When he sends his angels back, that's their hope. The Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. That's pretty plain. And if you believe in replacement theology, you are a lunatic. I mean, that's just in English, well, in, in America, what we mean is you're crazy. In Canada, you, I don't know what you might mean, but it might be worse than that, and I'm not going to say it. You can tell me later. No, you don't. If it's really bad, you don't tell me what I just said. When, I, when, I, when, I, when, you, when you travel in foreign countries, and Canada's not really that much of a foreign country for an American, and we're on the same continent, um, and we're not Mexico, <laughs> just thought about that too. But you go, and you've got to be careful. Over, over in the Philippines, you don't point with your finger. That's, that's very bad. You point with your nose or your lips. I can't even imagine that. I was like, is he going? <laughs> in America, that's throwing somebody a kiss. You know, you, can't, you get in trouble. I won't even tell you my Mexico trip where I had to eat the eyeball. Got a little amoeba on that one, too. But then we ate the brains and the tongue, too. It wasn't bad after that. Once you've eaten the eyeball, everything else is downhill. Isaiah 45, verse 4, who are the elect? For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect. So in the context of Matthew 24, he's going to gather his elect. Before the church has ever even started or revealed, who is the elect? It's Israel. He's going to gather his elect. So that prophecy is in the future about the nation of Israel. Mine elect, I have even called thee by my name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Review number four. The order of events. Following the tribulation of Mark 13, 5 through 23, the constellations do not give their light. Then they shall see this coming, Jesus coming. Then he sends his angels before him. They see him. Remember, he says there's a bright light. Remember, the whole sky turns bright. Well, think about it. If the, if the constellations, if the sun and the moon and the stars aren't shining anymore, that's going to be pretty easy to envision that it's going to be like there's the spotlight on Jesus. Then he's going to send his angels before him. Before his return, Christ's angels gather his elect. When the day of the Lord is near, the Lord will be the hope of his people, the children of Israel. And the context of the Gospels, Israel is mine elect, as we just saw. Now, I was in a meeting, major prophecy meeting. One of the guys came up and said, you know, man, did you see that guy over there with the long beard? And, no, no, he, you know, he said, in the last meeting we were at, this guy was there, and I swear he was Elijah. He showed up, and then he was gone. You know why they would think that? Because if they believe the day of the Lord is the seven-year period, then Elijah has to show up before the tribulation. He has to show up now. And if we saw him show up, we would know that we're out of here real soon. What are you looking for, Elijah? I'm looking for Jesus. What are you looking for, the 144,000, the two witnesses, because you're, you're pre-wrath or post-trib? You see, the only way you're looking for Jesus is if you believe that the rapture happens next. Because if you don't believe that the rapture happens next, you believe Elijah has to show up, <coughs> then you need to be go over to Israel, like, you know, I mean, and go there, and I mean, go there, stay there, and look for the two witnesses. You need to find the 144,000. You need to look for the abomination of the desolation. You need to look for all this other stuff. I'm looking for Jesus. Because I know that's what I'm told to look for. Elijah, before the day of the Lord, somebody's phone is ringing. Micah 4, 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before what? The coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So Elijah comes before the day of the Lord, and he's one of the two witnesses. 
And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So you know what the two witnesses are here for? To turn the nation of Israel to God. Elijah sent as one of the two witnesses in Revelation 11.3 before the day of the Lord to delay God's judgment. In Zephaniah 1.7, Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord, God, for the day of the Lord is what? At hand. It's not here yet in this verse. But there's silence. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. He hath bid his guests. And it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. Hold thy peace. That sounds a little bit like silence in heaven. Revelation 8, 1, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven. Sometimes some people think, well, it's just in all. <coughs> this seal, the seventh seal is open, followed by the seven trumpets. There's silence in heaven. Maybe it matches that verse over there in Zephaniah 1, 7. About the space of a half an hour, and I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So in that seventh seal, when it's open, we'll have, the seven trumpets will sound. Thirty minutes of silence in heaven just prior to the seven trumpets and the seven vials. The mighty will cry. Zephaniah 1.14, the great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. Notice it says the day of the Lord is what? It's near. It aligns with Revelation 6. The kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath. The wrath of the Lamb for the great day of His wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? The mighty men shall cry, it says. They're going to cry what? Let the mountains fall on us. Men are going to seek death at that time, and death will flee from them. Because God is going to judge this earth. You've got to be kidding. Five minutes. I'm in number 13 of 36. We will continue this tomorrow afternoon. After my five minutes. Sounding of the alarm trumpet, Zephaniah 114. It continues. We read 114, now verse 15. That day, what day? Look at the top, day of the Lord, is a day of wrath. Just like, just like Brother Hawking said, it, it, the day of the Lord is not a good time. It's terrible. It's a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities, against the high towers. I hope I can get through the alarm trumpets. That's all I want to do. You pray with me over there with a the sign that said five minutes. Okay, what are those alarm trumpets? Numbers 10.1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver. Of a whole piece thou shalt make them, and thou, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And if they blow but with one trumpet, then the princes which are the heads of the thousands of Israel shall gather themselves unto thee. So you have two types of trumpets. You have the gathering trumpet, and you have the alarm trumpet. If you blow with one trumpet, it's a gathering trumpet. The first trumpet's a gathering trumpet. And here's review number five, and there it is. The gathering versus the alarm trumpet. I just need to get through this part. 2 Thessalonians 2.1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. You see, when you read the trumpets that you see that Paul referred to, he's referring back to Numbers chapter 10, and he's referring to the gathering trumpet, not the alarm trumpet. You know what the alarm trumpets are? The seven trumpets of Revelation. So just keep this in mind. You may have to keep it till tomorrow, but we'll get there. This gathering takes place at the trump of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. That's a gathering trumpet. 
and the dead in Christ shall rise first. How do you know? Because they're being gathered. And then we which are alive and remain, and I don't know how long that is in between these two, shall be caught up until the last trump. So you have a trumpet. And maybe at the last trump, which is the last sound in a series of trumpet sounds, that's the last trump. We which are alive and remain are caught up together within the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. We are alive and remain until the last trump. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorrupt, and we shall be changed. This doesn't mean it's the final trumpet of all time. There'll be seven more trumpets after these gathering trumpets. Look closely at the order. The trump of God sounds, the dead in Christ are raised first. Those remaining alive are changed at the last trump. So if the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ leave out. And maybe that trumpet continues to sound until that last trump, and then we go up. I'm going to stop here at the Jewish feast days. I think it's better to go ahead and stop here on number 18. Judy, if you don't mind, if you'd write that down, number 18. And we'll pick that up uh, tomorrow Whenever I speak next, we'll pick it up from there. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for sending your son to die for our sins. I just pray, Lord, that you'll take the message that's been given. Uh, Lord, we thank you for all the messages today. Thank you for all the opportunity that you give us. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen.